Kyle Larson tested an IndyCar again, plus should the Indianapolis 500 have guaranteed starting spots? NASCAR news is a little slow this week, so let's dive into some IndyCar stuff before their season gets started here in a few weeks. There's going to be a few different topics that dominate the early half of the season, whether it's hybrid, Kyle Larson from the Indianapolis 500, or the question of whether or not there should be guaranteed starting spots in the Indianapolis 500. Let's get into Kyle Larson first. He had a test on Monday night at Phoenix International Raceway, or Phoenix Raceway, whatever they want to refer to it as now. It was supposed to be on Wednesday with his Aero McLaren, HendrickCars.com team, but instead they moved that race up to Monday afternoon into Monday night to avoid the rainstorms that are coming, which also plagued Southern California and canceled the, well, forced the clash to move up. So Larson and the team were battling weather coming in. So on Monday night, he ran 172 laps and got to experience how the IndyCar feels somewhere other than Indianapolis, which I think is a good thing all around. He mentioned that he learned a lot of things, and at one point, the car stepped out on him, and he learned how to, you know, basically save it and catch it. All of these are good things. He said that the car started off pretty tight, understeer, if you're in the IndyCar world, and he had to learn how to compensate for that. He said he's working the weight jacker and using his tools within the cockpit, and these are all things that are great to learn before you get to the speedway, because going 180 mile an hour and doing this is, as ridiculous as it sounds, easier than doing it at 220 to 240 mile an hour down the backstretch for qualifying. So for him to be able to work on this at Phoenix and get a better feel for the car before he heads off to the speedway in May is really beneficial. Of course, he completely breezed through his ROP for the Indianapolis 500 last fall at the Speedway, so he doesn't have to worry about that when they get back there for May. He can just focus on getting in at practice and then qualifying for the race. So being able to go out to Phoenix and, you know, test some things out. He obviously lives in Phoenix. I'm not sure if a lot of people know that, but he does reside in Phoenix, so it's pretty easy uh, for him to be able to get over the track and test the car out. And it was beneficial. It helps him get more familiar with his engineering staff. That's going to be on his timing stand. Helps him familiarize himself with the cockpit and the car and the tendencies of what an Indy car is on an oval. It's not the easiest thing in the world to drive, contrary to what Formula One fans seem to believe. So for Larson, all of this made total sense, and hopefully it pays off for him when they get to the Speedway in May, and he can just hop right in, go out there, and put down some absolute flyers doesn't have to worry about Brian Barnhart leading in and saying, give me four good ones. The other IndyCar topic that is sure to get people's blood boiling if you're an IndyCar diehard is the question of whether or not there should be guaranteed starting spots for the Indianapolis 500. And if you're a NASCAR fan watching this, you're probably going, well, the Daytona 500 locks in 36 chartered cars with four open spots. What's the big deal? And I can see both sides of this argument. So Roger Penske mentioned that he's intrigued or interested, rather, in bringing in the idea of locking in cars for the Indianapolis 500, have a guaranteed starting spot. And if you're a longtime IndyCar fan, as soon as I said that, you immediately thought of the 25 and 8 rule. Uh, so in the mid 90s, when IRL and CART split, the IRL decided that the top 25 cars and points going into the Indianapolis 500 within the IRL would be locked into the race. Then there would be eight spots for all the CART teams as well as any other IRL teams to come and compete and try to get into the race. So basically there were only eight spots open for the Indianapolis 500. That ran for two years and then they scrapped it and a whole bunch of other stuff, but people absolutely hated that idea. One of the traditions of the Indianapolis 500 is the fastest 33 cars start. It doesn't matter what your name is, it doesn't matter what your team is. If you're Roger Penske and you're not fast enough, go home, pack up your stuff, you're out of here. If you're Graham Rahal, you're not fast enough last year, bye. McLaren, two-time world champion of Fernando Alonso, you're too incompetent to figure out how to set up a car, go home. That's just what it is. It's one of the biggest traditions at Indianapolis. Bump day as kind of neutered as it has become in recent years with only maybe one or two cars going home, Bump Day used to be this extravagant event where everybody's on the edge of their seat, people are walking up and down pit lane completely nervous, Gasoline Alley is tension filled as these guys try to figure out how to get more speed out of their car. And we saw it last year with Graham Rahal and Jack Harvey and just how nervous everybody is down there. There's something about being put on the hot seat that makes the Indianapolis 500 great. It's all about the traditions leading up to the event, and to get rid of those traditions feels like we're being robbed in a sense. On the other hand, though, I can completely understand where Roger Penske and other team owners are coming from. They said this is more about the survival of the sport. 
And I can understand that. You want your biggest names to be in your biggest race. You want your biggest names with the biggest sponsors, or any sponsor rather, to be in the biggest race. It's the most viewed race of the season, has the most eyeballs on it. It's the most ROI for a sponsor. So guaranteeing that starting spot makes a lot of sense. It also pays the most out of any other race as well. So you would like to have some of that money. I can understand where they're coming from. Does it bum me out as I think if anybody's following me long enough, especially after last year's Indianapolis 500, I'm a bit of an IndyCar purist, especially when it comes to the Indianapolis 500. 500 miles means 500 miles. We never go over. The race ends at the scheduled race distance. I hate the fact that they did the red flags, and I hate the fact that we're even exploring this 25 and 8 rule. But I understand. So that's a bit of a conundrum, of course. When it comes down to it, Roger's ultimate goal for IndyCar is to institute a NASCAR-style charter system for the IndyCar series. Whether that's in 2025 or 2026 remains to be seen. But he's trying to create some sort of asset for these IndyCar owners that guarantees them a chunk of money out of the TV revenue, prize money, whatever they decide to do with it. And then those charters, of course, like NASCAR, will be transferable and will be up for sale should an owner want to get out of the sport or whatever. Don't hate the idea, like the idea, but with that comes the fact that you will have to have some sort of guarantee for the Indianapolis 500 for those chartered teams, meaning that they'll have to be locked in and leaving open. I mean, how many charters do you give out? Do you give out 24? Do you give out 25, 26? Remains to be seen, but then that limits the number of open spots that you have available. And is it going to deter people from running an Indianapolis 500 only program? I don't think so, because there's still going to be a lot of people that are like, we have the speed to get in here. One-offs, especially coming from one of the big teams, will continue on. But I think it could deter other people like an Able Motorsport or, or even Carlin from trying to run like a third car when they did RIP to their IndyCar program. But I think it could really deter some people from wanting to do that. Even Hunkos, when they were a small team uh, trying to get started, I can see that being a deterrent for them, where they're like, ah, you know, there's seven open spots, let's say. We know that there's seven pretty competitive cars. Do we want to be that eighth car to show up and maybe make the race and spend a lot of money? Upwards of, you know, a million, million and a half. I don't know. So IndyCar's got a lot of things to work on. Of course, I think we all knew that. But at least their docuseries on the CW, 100 Days to Indy, is coming back this year. That's awesome. Wish it was on maybe a streaming platform, but it was really well done last year in 2023. Excited to see what happens in 2024. And of course, just excited for the Indianapolis 500. My favorite race of the year. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you all there. So like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.